Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for your time, and uh, hopefully over the next 20 minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about Open Orphan and what's been happening in the first quarter of our trading period since we went public. Um, now, I know there's a lot of background noise, and hopefully you can hear me. Um, uh, above the din, I hope I can make this very clear. Um, so, uh, first of all, some of you might be asking, and some of you I recognize from before, but just what are orphan products? And orphan products are drugs that are designated orphan uh, because they're treating rare diseases. When I talk about rare diseases, that means it's affecting one or 2,000 people or less. So it might be considered a small market, but globally, there are 300 million people who suffer from rare diseases. Uh, in Europe alone, there's 30 million people. So this is a huge market that's untapped and unattended to, actually, from the pharmaceutical market, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, so it's a large market. What Open Orphan is doing, we don't have our own products. We're a pharma services company. We bring products for, from our clients, other pharma or biotech companies, through the pre-clin, uh, clinical evaluation, regulatory approval and reimbursement. So we really add value to their products and bring them to market. So a little bit about Open Orphan. Um, the usual disclaimer applies. Um, so we are an AIM and your next listed company. Um, we went public uh, in June of 2018 via a reverse takeover of Venn Life Science, which was an existing Crow or a clinical research organization. Our market cap currently is about 17 million. We're 6.55 today. Uh, we, as I said, a reverse take over a VEN, um, which was in the clinical research organization. I'll tell you a little bit about the management that's now running Open Orphan that acquired uh, VEN Life Sciences. Um, <clears throat> we have a very existing, we have very pertinent experience in finance, pharmaceuticals, and in the orphan drug product space. Uh, Currently, the management owns about 35% of the company. Um, the institutional investors about another 35, 40%, and then uh, the other 25% is hopefully of interest to you guys. Um, in last year, so 2018, and again, this is before we acquired Venn, there was revenues of 14 and a half million in the company, so a, a very nice revenue earner. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we're correcting that and how it was incorrectly rated during that time. Um, as part of our acquisition, as part of our strategy going forward, and we've, we've told this to the market, we're a bolt-on acquisition strategy company. So we're building companies who have expertise in the orphan drug space uh, and really bring them under the banner of Open Orphan to really deliver a pan-European market uh, for orphan drug products across Europe and globally. Um, we're also rolling out two digital platforms. It's all about the data associated with rare diseases. Uh, we're, dri we're dri driving those through uh, to help deliver in the next uh, year. Um, and we're doing that by really engaging with not only the patients, but patient advocacy groups. So it's a B2B kind of strategy where we're really corralling the data for rare disease patients to, to drive further research and new treatments into those untapped diseases. Um, we have a huge customer base, about 30 companies that are active in our clinical evaluation consultancy business. Uh, a lot of them are repeat customers. So we have a good, a good kind of reputation within our existing customers. And we're so confident of this space. This is the fastest growing segment of the pharma market. It's double the, the, the rate of any other uh, segment. We, we are confident that we will have dividends available in two years. And we have a very clearly defined exit strategy, which I can get into as we go through the talk. So that's a little bit of an opener, a little bit of the highlights. Um, the, the leadership team, Cahal Friel, he's a CEO. Uh, Cahal sends his apologies, couldn't be here today. Uh, but Cahal is a stockbroker by trade. Um, his first real kind of good, good investment was the Marion Stockbrokers, which was acquired by Linsbinky Bank in 2003. Um, for 80 million, actually 2000, sorry, uh, for 80 million. Um, he's then gone on to uh, found Fastnet, which is an oil and uh, gas company. Uh, it did really well, raised 50 million off AIM. Um, however, when the, the price of oil dropped, that kind of went into its own shell, so to speak. Um, he also is a founder of Amred Pharmaceuticals, or Pharma, an orphan drug product space, uh, treating EB, or a, a very debilitating rare disease, or skin, skin disorder. And that's now a $300 million company about to be listed on NASDAQ as well as AIM. Um, 
He's also the founder of Raglan Capital. So he's a stockbroker, financial guru. He knows the public markets um, and really uh, is a huge power within the company. There's Brendan Buckley, who is the chairman, uh, non-exec chairman. Uh, Brendan has spent most of his life in the clinical research uh, space. He's worked with Icon as the chief medical officer from 2000 and 13 to 17, uh, that's when his company Fastnet was acquired by Icon. Very, very engaged in the leadership team there, very skilled in mer mergers and acquisition, and that's really critical in our strategy to bolt on uh, various acquisitions as part of our growth strategy. Um, he's also worked with the EMA, and he's worked with the EMA in the orphan drug space. What are the orphan drug space legislation and protocols that were to be put in place so that we could drive this segment of the market? Uh, and he was the key instigator and author in, uh, of those protocols. So Brendan knows drug development, knows the orphan space. And finally myself, I've had several companies, uh, Hybrogen, Genomics Medicine Ireland is probably the most recent one you might have heard of, uh, uh, an objective to whole genome sequence 10% of the Irish population because it's a very homogeneous population for drug development purposes. Uh, recently acquired by Wuxi Nextcode for a non-disclosed sum but after a 400 million investment into the company. So. I'm used to being involved in uh, entities that are in uh, disease uh, with a genetic basis and orphan uh, rare, rare diseases, fundamentally all of them have a, rare, have a genetic cause. So this is pertinent to my expertise in drug development and research. Um, and a few other things there that I'll let you read at your leisure. So the appropriate leadership team that has expertise in finance, drug development, orphan space. So I think we know what we're doing. <clears throat> So you might ask, you know, why, why are orphan products now the fastest growing segment of the pharma market? Uh, for example, they, they're growing at twice the rate of non-orphan products. And this is because of the legislation that was put in place 20 years ago in the US and in Europe to really incentivize companies to do research to develop products for these rare diseases. Um, some of the incentives are listed here, for example, um, and some of them are not actually, but uh, there's a huge amount of products in development that are designated orphan, that's two and a half, th two and a half thousand, that's our pipeline of business. Um, you do smaller clinical trials in the evaluation of the product. <clears throat> 30 million people in Europe, 300 million worldwide, a huge market, huge amount of consulting uh, operating as a, as a result of that, and that's why we're in this space. The price you can garner for orphan products is about four and a half times what you can get for non-orphan products. You have shelf exclusivity or market exclusivity in the US for seven years post-registration, uh, 10 years in Europe, and any of your costs associated, R&D costs associated with uh, orphan drug products are tax deductible. So a huge amount of incentives uh, to really drive the research and drive these products. It's taken about 20 years to see the impact of that, and that's why it's now the fastest growing segment of the market. Um, so we're in a growth space. Uh, it's really, really exciting space. This is uh, the, the business model associated with Open, open Orphan. So the first one I talked about already, um, it is uh, the Crow, the consulting clinical research, uh, clinical trial company. We acquired Venn, and, and that's really driving a lot of the business. I'll tell you a little bit about that in the next slide. The other two parts of the business are the digital platforms. The virtual rep is uh, really uh, a part of the business that I, I will talk about, but I'll more concentrate on the genomic side, the genomic health data, which hopes, we hope to launch in, in Q1 of next year. So a little bit about Venn. It was undercapitalized. It was underutilized. Staff was 60%, staff utilization was 60%. We're right-sizing, we're correcting Venn from a staff utilization perspective, from a utilities perspective, from an expertise fit for purpose perspective. Um, but despite all that, it, and it was loss making, um, despite all that it had a very good customer base, repeat customers, mostly in the orphan space. So we acquired it, we saw an opportunity here. We acquired it for four million uh, just last June. That was at the time when it had revenues of 14 million. And most companies in this space are rated at two and a half to three times revenues. So typically, if it had been properly rated, it would have been maybe valued about 30 million. We acquired uh, then for four million. Uh, <clears throat> we're we're right-sizing then, if you will. Uh, strong customer base that we can build on. And we're, we're rolling out our you know, uh, digital platforms. So the goal for us over the next year, and uh, this is really important, we will recapitalize then. Uh, we've done that. We raised four and a half million on the market institutional investors in June. 
restructure, we're right sourcing and we're correcting profit making. Because of all these corrective measures we're taking, we hope by H1 next year we will be profitable. It's the first time in its history that Venn will have been profitable. Uh, and we want to re-rate. Based on that re-ration and our build, both on acquisition strategy to get our revenues up to close to 50 million, we will uh, re-rate to about two and a half to three times uh, share price. So this is just a little bit of the, the strategy. It's a bolt-on acquisition strategy. We are in active discussions with uh, potential uh, acquisition targets, and we will announce an acquisition before the end of this year. <clears throat> These are all like small and medium sized, you know, consulting houses in the orphan drug space. It'll be, they'll be acquired for very little cash. It'll be mainly a share exchange, uh, equity exchange for the purchase. So that will also, they'll also be revenue generating. So on top of the 40 million that we have, they will also have uh, additional revenue. So the expectation of how we've guided the market is that we will get to 30 million very quickly. Um, and then we will come up, 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 up above the parapet for the, the big icons, IQBS, PPDs, the big CROs who are global players who have no franchise in the orphan space. So this is exactly what we want to do. Getting above that, you know, towards that 50 million will also uh, get us re-rated at two and a half to three times revenue. So that's a lot of information I know, and I, I tend to rush a little bit because I think very quickly. We, we're moving very quickly to correct uh, Venn. Open Orphan is in a growth segment. We have the appropriate leadership. We're correcting all the utilities, tangible uh, activities, facilities within the company. And we're also rolling out two digital platforms. Let me talk a little bit about the genomic health data platform. And our objective here is to become the largest broker for rare disease data uh, across Europe but it can be a, a global platform. Uh, it's in the final phase of development, so we just recently announced a collaboration with Empiric Logic, which is a software developer. They have a proprietary uh, privacy-preserving and AI-enabled platform that sits on top of our platform uh, that will really enable us to do a lot of additional things with this uh, platform, which I'll tell you about. Um, we're actively talking to pharmaceutical companies who are interested in, in interrogating this data. Uh, we're also working through the advocacy groups, the groups that lobby on behalf of these patients who put facilities, infrastructure, resources to support these patients on a day-to-day -day basis. We're, we're working through them to, to make the patients aware of our database. It's a low-cost collection strategy. By that I mean rare disease patients. If some of you may know some patients who have a rare disease, for a long time, they go through this odyssey trying to better understand their disease, get an appropriate formal diagnosis. So they're on an odyssey that can take between seven to 20 years. Uh, that means they have a huge amount of clinical data. In a lot of cases, genomic data, it already pre-exists. 50% uh, of rare disease patients across Europe have a, some level of genetic data analysis. So we're collecting all that. We're corralling this all in one location and make it, uh, making it analyzable by pharma companies the pharma companies can use that information to identify the genetic basis of this disease, and that's the basis of new diagnostic products and also new therapeutic products. Um, so I've, I've said all that. The artificial intelligence that also that's on top of the platform will help us identify those patients that will want to uh, participate in future clinical trials because they, because they have the appropriate rare disease and the appropriate genotype or genetic profile that will make them respond well to those drugs. So it's a new technology, it's a new concept. The schematic on the right really defines how this is going to work. And I have to say it's done in a way that it's GDPR compliant, so the data legislation empowers us to do this. It is all pseudonymized, it is encrypted, so the identity and the data of the patient is protected. So I guess in terms of GDPR, what's important here is that as part of the GDPR legislation, really what it enshrines to each and every one of us is that we own our data. So whatever data we, we is ours, we own it. We can we can keep it to ourselves or we can share it. And you can, you, can de you can decide where you want to share it. So under GDPR, we're asking the advocacy groups to lobby on our behalf and to advocate to their patient groups to share their data with us. This does a few things. It allows the drive research into their rare disease um, and, and potentially de will develop in future years new diagnostics, new therapies. 
if they do that, again, GDPR compliant, uh, protecting the identity of the individual, because this is about the aggregate data, not about the individual data. We put that into a format, we curate the data, we put it into a standard format in our database that is analyzable by pharma companies. The pharma companies access that data, they pay for that access, there's an access fee of course. And that access fee, a component of that, 50% after it costs, will be shared back to the advocacy groups. We, we do that for certain, thing, for certain reasons. Obviously we're doing this to drive research for new treatments, but we're also doing it so that by sharing this, uh, th this kind of access fees back to advocacy groups, we put in place infrastructure, or we help them put in place infrastructure to support these patients on a day-to-day -day basis. Finally, um, I guess you might ask, so how much does it cost? It's actually a low-cost model. It's not a huge amount of cost, and we guided the market that the entire setting up of the database would cost about 500,000. We're, we're pretty much, uh, very much below that. What we've also said is, what's the value of this? So the target, our target is to get to 10,000 patient records within the next two years. That's less than, one, that's one third of 1% of the, the European rare disease patient population. So we think we can do that. We know that data exists. Um, and what we're saying is, and I'll show you some precedents in the marketplace, each of those patient records is evaluated at about 5,000. So if we're collecting 10,000, the value of this database, nominal value of this database, is 50 million. Now, I say that because the nominal value is not the value. Many companies can look at this data in duplicate. It's a, it's a pre-competitive space. They can all look at the same data and decide if they want to develop a diagnostic or a different product. Once they're in their drug development programs, it's competitive. But at the time they're looking at this data, it's a pre-competitive, non-exclusive space. So the value of this database will be multiples of 50 million. Um, so this is hugely valuable. Um, it is a new concept. It is transformational to patients because it is allowing them to drive research into their rare disease and hopefully get better products. So I just want to show you some examples in the markets where we're, we're putting our value. So I'll come back to this slide. So these are some examples of companies that have raised money that are data brokers as well. Um, and by the way, there is copies of the slides at our booth, which is B3. Um, so feel free to come by and pick one up. Um, these companies uh, have all in the data space quite different from us, but so fundamentally, money is able to be raised for this concept. They're slightly different from us, we're unique, I should say, is, is that because we're very focused on the rare disease space. Most of these are just data brokers across all, all areas of, of the industry. And then the next slide is examples how much companies are prepared to pay for exclusive access to this data. So for example, 23andMe and GSK, they paid 300 million for access to Alzheimer's data. Again, these are just an example and value the, the data set at about 5,000 for rare disease uh, samples. So that's the, the genomic health database. It's, uh, we're in beta testing right now. We should announce in the next few weeks some pharma groups and advocacy groups that have come on board on the beta testing, and we're launching this in Q1 next year. If I could go back two slides, actually. <laughs> Sorry, could go back two slides? Just back two slides. Uh, <clears throat> one, one more? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, so this is the second digital platform. I don't want to talk about it too much other than to say in the U.S. market today, there's 520 orphan drug products on the market. In Europe, there's only 180. So there's a huge disparity of availability of orphan products in the, in the European market currently. That, that 380, that, is, uh, that disparity is our opportunity. We're working with those pharma companies to bring their products to the major European markets. And this digital platform will allow them to engage with all the physicians, the, uh, the consultants who treat these patients. It's a digital platform rather than having people in the field, sales and marketing, promoting those products. So I'm not going to say more about it other than it is a new concept for uh, sales and marketing of products that are coming down the pipeline of regulatory approval and reimbursement. Uh, and I guess um, <clears throat> these are products that don't exist before, so it's an easy sell. There was never a product in Europe before, now this is a product. So we're very excited to be rolling this out in the second half of next year. So. Finally, I'll just wrap up, and again, thank you for your time. Uh, new management team, um, track record of building businesses in, in many sectors, but fundamental expertise in this sector. Uh, it's a growth strategy. We're in the fastest moving segment of the market. 
uh, huge targets, under-met need in these rare diseases. And finally, we're so confident, as I said, uh, dividend in year two and a very clearly defined exit strategy. So thank you very much and happy to take some questions.